Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back for a record fifth appearance... My friend Meredith Angwin, uh, she is uh, the author of Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid. Meredith, welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm very happy to be here and very flattered to be here a fifth time. It's lovely. Well, you were last here in February of last year, February 18th, 2022 was when that episode aired. And we have just gone through a, a Christmas uh, winter storm in which there were a lot of blackouts. But before we get to that, we have to do the uh, uh, introduction. And I, for people who don't know you, I'm, it's required that guests on this podcast introduce themselves. So uh, I know you've been here before, but you have 60 seconds. Tell us who you are, please. Okay, my name is Meredith Angwin. I'm a physical chemist by training. I worked at uh, corrosion and uh, control and uh, and um, and pollution control in the electric utility industry for my working life. In semi-retirement, I began uh, defending the Vermont Yankee power plant, and that led me into a. Uh, 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 an interest in how the plant and the grid interacted with each other because there, there being an, a, a, a headline in the paper and I realized that after you know decades in the power industry I couldn't understand the headline so I began um, began uh, getting to know more and more about uh, how the auctions work how the grid operator dispatches plants and so forth and I found that reliability is not an important aspect of this whole thing in the in the uh, supposedly deregulated areas and i and when i tried to explain this to people i ended up getting very long-winded so i wrote a book which is called shorting the grid the hidden fragility of our electric grid so i guess that's about it and that book is now out two years is that right or yes, a little, a little two more years a little more than two years. And it's, it's funny, when I, I wrote it, I, I say it, I wrote it BT, before Texas, because uh, it was before the, the big uh, blackout in Texas. Now, those of us who were watching the grid had noticed for years and years and years that Texas ran with a very low reserve margin. They just didn't have very much freeboard. They were like a a, a boat that the, 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 the top of the gun whales were at the water level, you know, and gunnels. And so anyway, um, uh, that was, uh, you know, we, and then the day of it, the, for, for the week ahead of time, there were all these predictions on different groups I was in saying, Texas is going to be in trouble. Texas is going to be in trouble. And I just stayed up at night thinking maybe they won't, maybe they won't. And as a matter of fact, when they began the rolling blackouts, that's when I went to bed. I was like, okay, it's happened just like I predicted. Watching it won't change it and, and so forth. But it, if people are like, it was an unexpected event, I'm like, unexpected by who? I mean, <laughs> there were plenty of people who predicted it, expected it, et cetera. So just one quick point I wanted to make on your book. So you self-published Shorting the Grid. Is that right? You didn't have yes, a publisher did. and you created a Carnot Communications, I guess. It was well, a, that was your, your trade name then for the book. Yeah, well, I actually had published other things as Carnot Communications. I have a book about nuclear advocacy mm -hmm. called uh, Campaigning for Clean Air. And I just always thought that Carnot Communications was a great name because uh, it's the Carnot cycle, which is the uh, the the most effective uh, thermodynamic cycle. You can't actually build one, but uh, if, if you could, you know, that's the most efficient cycle for taking heat like from a fire or a, a gas turbine and turning it into useful work like a turbine spinning or the wheels of your car spinning sure. so i mean i just i just thought that was fun it's sort of like a little in joke sure um and that's of course the french scientist carnot who determined that yeah. you can't have a 100 percent efficient heat engine right that this yes, is their limits right. on thermodynamic limits okay so Let's cut to the chase here and talk about what's been happening on the grid. And um, uh, Bloomberg had a remarkable story that was published just uh, yesterday. Uh, it was headlined that the entire uh, grid uh, narrowly dodged huge collapse. Those were the key words in the headline. Um, and the, the key sentence here, the strain in North Carolina, the, the focus was on Duke, 
uh, and its uh, service ter the territory. The strain in North Carolina threatened to throw the flow of power off balance on the entire eastern interconnection grid stretching from Maine to Oklahoma and required grid to uh, a Duke to institute outages on its own system to protect, protect the grid at large. So I, I knew that there were problems and TVA of course had blackouts as well. And these are regulated utilities, not RTOs. But so yes, I know. this is, um, I mean, it, it's outside of what your thesis was about, but right. the, the broader implications here to me are, well, what's the punchline? This, this storm demonstrated again, the fragility of the electric grid. how, I mean, how close did we come to blackout? I mean, a possible failure of the Eastern interconnection. Well, I would say that we came close, except we've got really great grid operators, and they they uh, they they did rolling blackouts, and they 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 instituted you know one one uh, emergency situation measure after another, you know, and asking for people to uh, cut back, pulling in all their demand response, telling every every power plant to get online, uh, you know, even if, if it wasn't scheduled to be online, and finally rolling blackouts. And so they kept the grid up. And that's what they're supposed to do. The thing is, it's not supposed to be so dramatic. What you want is a boring grid, a grid where, you know, the, the, the problem that the operators have is like, we need a lot of coffee because really, it just nothing, nothing much going on around here that we haven't seen a million times. But that is not what was going on around Christmas. And one of the things I think that nobody is 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 uh, is noticing about it is that you know people are are focusing on the weather and on the failures of the. Uh, uh, the natural gas to be delivered. Okay. I mean, that was a big deal. There were compressor failures. There were plants going offline. Uh, but I think nobody's noticing that people are saying, and it was the highest demand day ever on the grid. Well, okay. Was it the coldest day ever on the grid? No, it was one of the colder days. That's for sure. But nobody has said such temperatures have never been seen before in Tennessee. No, nobody's saying that. And the reason they're not saying it is this, it isn't true. It's unusual, but it's not out of the bounds of what people should be expecting on the grids in a cold snap in the winter. I mean, it's it's a heavy duty cold snap, but that shouldn't be such a close call. And uh, well, so where are you going with this? Because what I'm 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 leaping ahead or trying to walking just a little bit ahead of you here. I think in that. I also saw there was a, a headline about the fact that now there's been a big increase in electric only heating in the South and that, yes, that of course. Was, and that that was one of the key reasons for the high demand load, which to me speaks to this whole craziness. And I'll use that word. And I think it is the right word for this electrify everything push. If we elect, try to eliminate all gas heating in, in homes across the country, well, then you're going to place a massive amount of new demand on the grid during these periods of extreme uh, weather and increase the possibility of grid failures. Am I am I wrong? You're, you're correct. And one of the things, that's was the point I was going to make, and I was kind of moving up toward it. And that is <laughs> before, I before I rudely interrupted, but that's, no, my, no, that's, my, fine. Job. that's my job. Case, it was great. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that basically... Nobody is, seems to be noticing that the uh, the demand on the grid was unprecedentedly high, but the the temperatures weren't, and and that is because of all the the movement toward you know you know get rid of your gas furnace, buy do your part for the environment and buy an electric stove, do your part for the environment and buy an electric car, and you know. Now, obviously, most people haven't thrown out their stoves. Electric cars are still not exactly in every garage, but a lot of people have changed this way because uh, there's there's a, a push toward it. It seems like the proper thing to do. There are rebates and 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 subsidies and all kinds of things that happen if you begin to go more electric. And what does that do? It, what it does is it has people going more electric and then you get a cold snap on the grid and everybody goes like unprecedented, just unprecedented use of electricity. No, it's what you planned for. I mean, you didn't plan for it. It's what you in it, you you put the incentives in place and the incentives were both financial and moral. The idea is that if you were to uh, uh, put your um, 
uh, buy a, a gas furnace now, you're being immoral. You're, you're just not doing the right thing. You should be buying um, heat pumps, uh, you know, and so forth and so on. And 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 the heat pumps are very inefficient during extreme extremely cold weather. And so, yes. I mean, I, I know this from experience and I've lived in a house in a, with a heat pump and it was terrible. I mean, I wanted a resistance heater. We bought a bunch of those dish heaters and that was what we wanted in our, you know, in our, in, in right in our room because they were warmer. They were much more, as you pointed out a long time ago, that that radiant heat is very soothing to us as mammals yes. that we like, we like that. Um, but let's, let's shift to new England, if you don't mind, because I think this, uh, I mean, we talked a little bit about, I want to come back to this, what happened in the Eastern interconnection, but you're in Wilder, Vermont. You were blacked out for what, two days right before Christmas? Yes, we were backed out for 36 hours. Okay. And uh, the thing is that we have a well-insulated home. Homes in Vermont tend to be well insulated. Middle-class homes tend to be well-insulated. I mean, right. I'm not pretending that there are no people in Vermont in, 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 in homes that are not well-insulated. But most people who can insulate their home, okay? And and uh, so ours was well-insulated. And then there was 36 hours without... Uh, ability to uh, heat the house from our main uh, uh, oil burning furnace because that furnace is controlled by electricity. But we are, we are like many Vermonters, we have a backup. And in our case, a backup was a very nice little uh, uh, propane uh, burning fireplace in the living room and another propane heater in the mudroom. And between those two, we didn't have any pipes freezing. And we, we, we were able to sit around by the propane heater in the living room and, and take our, our, our meals out and eat them in the living room like a kind of picnic. I mean, what I'm just trying to say is we weren't really suffering. Uh, but it's because we have a propane tank right outside the back door. So we then, have, so, so we have energy, fuel stored on site at our house. And this is key. You And a point that you've made over and over, we've discussed this about this, the energy security. Well, what is energy? As, as a, oh, Bill Fisher, he used to be the head of the uh, Bureau of Economic Geology here in Austin uh, at UT Austin. And he said, well, what that energy security is, he, he has a, he has, I think he was from Illinois, he has a sweet, sweet accent. He said, well, you know, the coal plants they like because they got that big old pile of coal out there in the yard and, you know, that they knew where their energy was. And so your energy security, the resilience of your home was made better because you had on-site fuel, propane and oil, although the oil wasn't useful to you because your furnace couldn't, your furnace was electrically controlled, but That's you right. had an, you had an alternative that made you energy secure because that was on-site fuel. Yes. And, and, you know, it's funny. We, uh, uh, um, I went out, uh, to lunch. My, George and I went to lunch yesterday with a friend of ours and we were all having lunch and we were all saying pilot lights, they're the best. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is, you know, that you can turn on your, your gas, uh, um, fireplace or your gas uh wood stove that is set up to be like a wood burning stove but it burns gas with a propane tank outside and a pilot light you don't have to you don't have to do a whole lot of stuff you know no need for electric ignition is what you're going that's right going no to. need for electric ignition now of course in many cases you can bypass electric ignition if you've got fuel stored on site with some kind of clicker mechanism or or spark mechanism that you use by hand right. but basically uh most of us are un well i shouldn't say most of us i get uncomfortable with that because i have to turn on the gas and then i'm trying to get the spark going and and so i prefer a pilot light as a safety thing and that's another thing i want to talk about and that is this push toward uh, let's electrify everything. People seem to have uh, forgotten about safety and personal safety and 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 so forth. Um, uh, let me give you a, a, a kind of uh, odd example. There's a, a Catherine Porter in uh, in England writes a, a, a blog, uh, a What Logic. She knows a lot about. Uh, well, I mean, she's a professional in in uh, in grid issues. And one of the things she says is that, you know, when she talks to firemen, they really don't want you to go to bed and turn on your dryer. 
even though in the middle of the night, the electricity is more available. From their point of view, dryer fires are a thing. I mean, dryers can collect lint in places you don't expect them to collect it. They can, you know, they can have a fire. And so even in something as simple as that, like, oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just run all my heavy duty electrical appliances while I'm sleeping. The firemen aren't always that crazy about this. Well, and also it goes to the issue of working women and when is convenient for them or, or working men. I mean, there's no, no sexual bias here, but doing that laundry, it's much easier to do it when you're ready to fold it and you've got it and then you can get it all tidied up, go to bed, but to run it overnight. Well, that's not as convenient. Same with the dish. It's not as convenient or- and you're going to have a, a kind of wrinkled laundry and, 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 and you know, uh, the laundry nowadays have dryers have a, a spit, a, uh, a cycle where they keep spinning a little bit so that uh, that they things don't clump up in the bottom and get totally wrinkled. But that cycle only lasts for about like forty five minutes an hour every ten minutes, and right. then it's done. You know. So, so then, what happened with your your who provides your electricity there in Wilder? And by the way, I've been in your home. It's a his, an historic home on the Connecticut River. Um, who's your electricity provider there? Green Mountain Power. And what was the reason for the blackout? What did they? Oh, to? it was very clear what was the reason. They, they, there was a, an amazing uh, wind and 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 heavy snow. Uh, actually, it was mostly heavy snow, heavy wet snow. I mean, I really hate heavy wet snow because it brings down all kinds of tree limbs and power lines and 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 you really. Um, I think that Green Mountain Power does an admirable job of of of, of keeping uh, their power lines clear. They're not the equivalent of uh, of PG&E in California. They are not, and they couldn't be because if they were, every winter uh, it would be a disaster around here. Um, but uh, you know, they they were I, they had a, a page of 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 where there are outages right after that storm. And uh, man, there was like hundreds of outages. Uh, You know, they had, and they had asked, uh, prepared earlier, they had expected the storm to be particularly bad in Vermont. And they had asked for reinforcements from uh, Connecticut and and other places. And they had the reinforcements. And and, and you you could see bucket trucks that were not green or bucket trucks all over the place, uh, fixing the lines and, and, and pulling things down from the lines and so forth. You know, that, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is one thing about the electric industry that I think is is uh, really remarkable. This mutual aid concept of the different oh, yes. utilities and the linemen. I got mad respect for linemen. I think these oh, are yeah. the, the people uh, as I've well, I've told a lot of my, my who are my people. My people are the people who turn wrenches. I love those people. Those are the people I advocate for. I don't you know, those are the people who make things, fix things, turn wrenches. Those are my people. I I. Uh, but the linemen in particular, their ability to get out there and, and bring and keep up the electricity flowing. They're just amazing. But yeah. now let's, let's back up from you're, you're out of power for 36 hours. It comes back on, but ISO new England then goes through, I mean, a near crisis in, in, and turns to heavy use of oil fire generation because of the lack of nat gas, right? What talk, talk That's about a that. Really was- complicated issue because, um, it turned out that there was a period there when oil was less expensive than natural gas. Mm-hmm. And so every plant that could burn oil was going for it because the expense of natural gas was uh, was setting the price on the grid. But if you could burn oil and get the grid clearing price, you were doing really well. Uh-huh. I mean, at one point there, but it, it, was a, it was a mixture of what they call... Uh, Merit order, that is the the uh, oil should be dispatched first because it's cheaper. Uh-huh. And uh, the fact that natural gas was in uh, relatively uh, short supply. Um, and, and therefore and, the price and the, for, therefore the price of nat gas on, on per million BTUs was higher. So the utilities were burning oil because that was the cheaper option. Yes, yes. And I, I, uh, Early in the fall, or maybe it was even earlier than that, um, 
uh, Gordon Van Wally, of the uh, the CEO of of, of uh, uh, ISO New England, gave a talk, uh, and one of the things he said was that they didn't think they uh, needed a winter reliability program where they would pay. Uh, power plants to keep oil on site because they had the prediction that oil would be less expensive than natural gas. And so the power plants would do it anyway. And it turns out their prediction was correct. Hmm. Well, and that's because of the lack of, of gas capacity, gas availability, pipelines, et cetera, in the Northeast, which I want to come back to, well, I don't want to go away from nor- the Northeast right now, but that was one of the other things that happened prior to Christmas was the sh- the widespread high uh, prices in the West that led to then high, very high power prices in California, Arizona, Nevada for weeks, uh, about two weeks, over $300 a megawatt hour. Um, but but back to New England. So you, you had roughly, th- uh, what, 30% of the of power at one point was being generated with oil-fired uh, power plants? Yeah, I Is think that it right? was more than 30%. But yeah, 30% for sure, and more than that sometimes. And and that was a real it was a real surprise to me because the last time this well it wasn't a surprise I'd written a blog post about it and stuff but the last time that this happened when we were burning a lot of oil on the grid was in a very very bad cold snap where we had uh, the uh, winter reliability program where ISO New England was paying power plants to keep oil on site because they they would be needed it would be needed in case there was a a very bad cold snap and natural gas wasn't as available in this case uh it was cold but it wasn't it wasn't i mean around here a bad cold snap is when it gets up to zero during the day okay right, not right. when it gets down to zero at night <laughs> right and and we didn't have a bad cold snap we just had you know, cold weather. And, uh, and, and yet there was so much oil on the grid, but that's because the price of natural gas was so high. I see. And, and that was meaning then the, uh, that was the, the supplies were con- uh, constrained on the pipelines, but then you also had the issue of, I'm assuming LNG from the, what is the majestic, right. majestic import terminal in Boston, right? That that was the, uh, yeah, of- the it was the, um, I, that terminal keeps changing names, but right, it, yeah. it's over there by Mystic Generation. Yeah, I think that's right. It's, yeah, it's, I said it's right Mystic, there by right, Mystic yeah. Generation. It, it, every time it's, it gets sold, it changes names. Right. But it is an LNG terminal in Boston, and it, it gets a lot of the LNG that is used. But you understand, I, I make this joke about LNG tankers. I said they're big, but they can turn on a dime. They can't turn on a dime. They turn on a couple of dollars. You know, they, I mean, at one point, uh, there was a, ta- as the prices of, of, of natural gas were fluctuating, there was a tanker that went through the uh, Suez Canal one way and then turned around and went back the other way, because uh, it, it discovered that there were, the prices for natural gas were higher back in the original direction. Right. So, uh, you know, we ha- the thing about New England is that we are competing with everybody. We're competing with Europe for uh, LNG. And, and one of the big reasons for that, and not the only reason, but one of the big reasons is that we are really, you know, they're, they're all, the stop the pipeline people are always uh, alert and aware and out there with trying to stop a pipeline. And um, the net result is that we don't have pipelines to the Marcellus. Right. Though actually one of the things that's going on is that New York State won't allow a pipeline. And so the pipeline can't go through New York State to New England. And right now there's a, a lawsuit, which I'm not a lawyer, so I have no idea how it'll be settled, but a couple of the New England governors are suing New York State saying, you're interfering with interstate commerce by refusing to build a pipeline to connect uh, the Marcellus, uh, to permit rather, a pipeline right. uh, from from Pennsylvania to New England. Right. Right. That was what, uh, under the Andrew Cuomo administration in particular, there was the use of the Clean Water Act, I believe, that they were, the state was using, claiming that this, you know, these pipelines weren't weren't uh, going to, they were going to harm uh, the water quality in New York, and therefore they could stop them. 
Um, so it, 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 we've talked about gas. We've talked about oil in New England. How did renewables do during this very cold uh, snap? Well, I I don't, I'm not really sure on that. I know that renewables were uh, not as high as they should have been in the very high wind period because the wind turbines shut themselves down mm-hmm. in high winds. So, you know, renewables really, they never did great. I mean, renewables around here are basically between eight and maybe 14% of the grid. And uh, that's what they were doing during the cold snap. Right. Well, so then is it then is it fair to say that New England, as I and I think this is across the US, that, that the, the New England grid has become overly dependent on natural gas? Is that, oh, totally, is that a- totally overly dependent on natural gas? I consider myself, um, you know, in my uh, book and in my uh, my um, uh, idea of the fatal trifecta, I consider myself an equal opportunity insulter. <laughs> and that is, I insult renewables and I insult natural gas and so forth. In other words, nobody can say, oh, Meredith, she just bashes renewables, so she loves fossil. No, I don't love uh, natural gas being delivered just in time. I mean, I'm not insulting either of them by just pointing out that they have certain properties. Natural gas is delivered just in time. A compressor going out is a really big deal, Okay. And that was and, one of the and that was one of the issues on the Duke system, right? That there was a, a compressor went out on an Enbridge pipeline. Am I Enbridge, remembering? Enbridge, Enbridge uh, compressor went out somewhere in um, Tennessee, and almost immediately TVA and Duke had to begin rolling blackouts. And that isn't being reported very much. The only place I found it reported, uh, of course, Emmett Penny's grid brief reported it, but he had picked it up from um, Bloomberg. And uh-huh. I haven't seen it other places. I mean, I, I'm like, where's the outcry about this? Where's the, where are the people yelling and screaming? And they don't seem to be around. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, there's there's not very much of a, a constituency for pointing out these uh, these uh, weaknesses, right? That this is not right. a popular thing to be talking about. But the other thing that I thought was w- that is key here, I think, is that these blackouts, that the TVA situation, with the one with the Eastern Interconnection more generally, and Duke, and the and the the issue of gas availability, this came. Uh, this occurred less than 10 days after the North American Electric Reliability Corporation issued their report. I wanted to, I just pulled it, uh, the report this morning because I wanted to read it. Um, the, uh, the utility dive um, quoted John Mora, NERC's Director of Reliability Assessment and Performance. And this is a roughly, I think, December 19th. I uh, said, right. there, are, there are extraordinary reliability challenges and opportunities in front of us. And then the writer, I think it was Robert Walton, said, NERC has been warning about the speed of the energy transition in recent years. And then he quotes Mora again, and I think this is a great line. He said, just to say it, for the fourth or fifth time, managing the pace of our generation retirements and our resource changes to ensure we have enough energy and essential services is an absolute necessity. So NERC has been warning now for years about this early phase out of coal, early phase out of nuclear, and uh, I, and and this addition of renewables. And yet it seems like this is all falling on deaf ears, that there's no there's no sense of urgency uh, in among the policymakers at the state or federal levels to really address this. Am I reading misreading this? You're reading it right. But uh, the reason there's not a sense of urgency is that they're not really accountable to NERC. And and what I, I'm saying is that uh, I when I was writing uh, shorting the grid, uh, I I wanted to say more about NERC giving warnings. I wanted to say more about independent market monitors giving warnings. And the trouble is that the warnings are usually ignored. But if you write that in a book, you better. Uh, you better uh, uh, document that, you know, these warnings were ignored. That's like trying to prove a negative. And of course, somebody could pick up the book and said, huh, look at it in, in, in 19-something or other, in 2007, in this area, they they did something about the warnings and the, you're wrong. And I, But basically, yes, they don't have accountability. They have a lot of groups that are doing an 
excellent job of, of actually pointing out what the problems are. NERC and the independent market monitors are often excellent. But when you get right down to it, it's sort of like one word from you and I'll do just as I want, like it's a toddler, right? Uh, you know, you say no, the toddler says no back. <laughs> Well, so when, when you say that, so the, <clears throat> the lack of accountability is within the RTOs or the ISOs and the public utility commissions at the state level. So this is where yes. the, you have all this interconnecting, uh, uh, overlapping lines of responsibility, but no overall accountability. I'm, I'm just riffing here, but is that? Yes, that's that true. That's absolutely true. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, an example that I give sometimes is one of the problems with rolling blackouts, why we have rolling blackouts, which is different from when trees bring power lines down, is that we don't have enough power plants that can go online. Well, whose fault is that? Well, you might say, uh, the, the RTO, why doesn't the RTO encourage more power plants? Well, if that's not the RTO's business. The number of power plants is resource adequacy, and that is the business of the state. So if you ask the RTO, you don't have enough power plants, they say, oh, we know. But the thing is, we, we're not in charge of resource adequacy. So you go to the state, and the state may say, well, we don't want any dirty power plants. Or it may say, well, you know, we could organize a power plant, but when you get right down to it, would that power plant even make money on the uh, RTO auctions? You know, back in the day when we authorized the power plant, we also made sure that it had a rate of return. It was paid for its power. But now we don't do that anymore. You know, that's not our job anymore. It's not our job to, we may authorize a power plant, but we can't ensure that it'll be paid. Well, the RTO can say we run the auctions, but we can't can't authorize the power plants. So, and then NERC can say, well, we've pointed out the problems. Why aren't you guys doing something about it? I mean, it's it's just endless. It's just endless. And it is a it is a it is it is extremely dangerous for for end users because nobody's guaranteeing that the lights will go on. And it is extremely, it is going to be, if you pardon me saying so, extremely lucrative for lawyers, each of whom can interpret uh, the uh, levels of responsibility in, in a way as to uh, make sure that it's not their client who has it. Well, so as you're saying that, I'm thinking, so the RTO functions like a, a traffic cop. I mean, to I'm just yes. an, inventing an analogy here, but traffic ca a cop can't uh, force uh, local the local municipality to build more stoplights or or add more lanes to the highway. The traffic cop is just there to make sure that the cars don't collide at a given intersection. I'm, I mean, is that it's not the perfect analogy it's, here, but there's something. Am, am I in the right church anyway? You're in the right. This? You're you're correct. I mean, it is basically a it is basically a, a director. Now the thing is that they have. Several, uh, if you go to a RTO site, they'll talk about their, their different um, uh, obligations. And one of the obligations is the traffic cop obligation, which is usually called being the balancing authority. That is right. keeping the, the, the demand and the, um, and the uh, supply in balance in real time. So right. that, uh, okay, so they're the balancing authority. They also do, uh, at least our RTO does a lot of planning and writes a lot of reports on what should be done and so forth and so on. The thing is it can't do those things. It can just hope the states read the reports and say, great idea, but maybe not. And again, even if the state says great idea and, and says, yes, we absolutely have to have another nuclear plant here, would there be a would there be a guarantee that the nuclear plant could be uh, uh, pay back its 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 cost of uh, um, of being built uh, through the RTO auctions? Probably not, because uh, the RTO auctions favor plants with low capital costs and high fuel costs. I mean, that's what they favor. There's a I have a reference in my book. I keep referring to it. there's a there's a. a, a an article called Asymmetric Risk, uh, and it, it's about how RTO auctions favor some kind of plants and not other plants. So anyway. So I, I wanted to just read a little bit more from this utility dive. I think it was Robert Walton's article where he was covering the NERC report. And uh, he, he writes, MISO, the uh, Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, faces a 1,300 megawatt shortfall beginning next summer. 
which, quote, continues to grow throughout the 10-year assessment period as coal, nuclear, and natural gas generation retire faster than replacement resources are connecting. And then he goes on quoting uh, uh, Brandon Morris with MISO saying, who says, MISO is facing a reliability imperative as the region undergoes transformational change. With sizable segments of generation aging, the resource portfolio shifting to increasing amounts of wind and solar and load shapes potentially changing with electrification. So again, I mean, I, I keep seeing these reports. I, so there's a NERC report oh, yeah. last summer, and there was one now from the winter. And now, and they, and MISO warned, uh, remember, MISO warned of, of, of shortages of power in the summer, just as Holtec was closing, or rather, uh, Entergy was closing the Palisades plant in Michigan. And I yes. thought, well, this is just crazy town. What, you know, why is no one paying attention here? And, and there, I'll just add one other thing, because I think this is, it's directly germane here. The uh, Walton quotes um, Michelle Bloodworth, who's the CEO of America's Power, which is a, a, a the coal uh, fire generation lobby. Uh, that uh, she said that their analysis, that is America's Power, about ninety three thousand megawatts of coal fire generation have announced plans to retire by twenty thirty, and and she says, and we expect more coal retirements, especially during twenty six twenty eight because of EPA regulations. Therefore, coal retirements are almost certain to be even greater than NERC's assumptions. Well, so here, I mean, if these coal plants go away, and, and I've thought about writing this article, I haven't done it yet, but the headline would be, we should immediately quit closing coal plants. If we want to have a secure, reliable, affordable grid, we need to keep all the coal plants online. That's not a popular thing to say, but is, is that... It, it, does that ring true to you? I mean, if we're well, going to lose 100,000 megawatts of generation capacity? Well, I personally would like to see every coal plant replaced by a nuclear plant. But if it's me, not going to be replaced, Me too. Me too. But that's a that's a tall order. But we'll get to that. That's a tall order. And the thing is, I really have come to the conclusion that reliability is absolutely the most important thing. That is the most... A reliability and affordability is what makes ordinary people's lives decent. You know, it's what means that ordinary people can, you know, live in a house that's reasonably warm, uh, that can expect that the, if they 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 have a, 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 a an elderly member of the household who needs a warm room with a little space heater in it, that the room will stay warm because the the uh, the space heater will continue to have power. Right. I mean, there's so many things. Uh, oh, let's let's look at the fact that um, when I was on our town energy committee, uh, water treatment plants take a lot of power, and turning uh, turning the power off to water treatment plants is not a good thing. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that reliability is key, and those coal plants are not going to influence global warming so much that keeping them going is a clear and present danger to the future of humans and we're all going to die if we keep them going uh, that's not what is happening i mean to some extent humans like any any reasonable animal wants to live now okay uh, in other words the idea that possibly the coal plants will increase global warming okay but meanwhile, if you turn them off, you'll kill people now. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm in complete agreement with you, Meredith. And this is the part that I just think there's this collective blindness around the dangers that we're facing and that the there is no <clears throat> appreciation for what this the potential damage is here. And instead... We have now nearly a quarter trillion dollars, $240 billion in new subsidies for wind and solar that when you count the Inflation Reduction Act or, you know, as long with, along with the incentives for wind and solar that existed before the Manchin-Schumer bill passed, all of the money, all, all of the money is going toward these weather-dependent renewables, um, which to me is just, I, I, I don't know, if we're facing it, more- it's not good. If we're facing more extreme weather, colder, hotter, colder, or both, or or more extreme weather, longer periods, the last thing we should be doing is making our grid dependent on the weather. And yet that seems like we're just the hell bent on that very thing happening. Um, but I want to switch to this. There's the, I know I'm I'm talking a lot here, but I, I, well, that's I, I fine. 
But I want to point out, too, that it was in addition to the NERC report, there was a report from the Western Electricity Coordinating Council that I think came out in November. It was the 2022 Western Assessment of Resource Adequacy. And it said over the last decade, approximately 23 gigawatts of resources were retired in the U.S. portion of the Western interconnection. Approximately 18 gigawatts were coal or natural gas. And over the next decade for the entire interconnection, these numbers will increase with a planned retirement of nearly 26 gigawatts, mostly coal and natural gas by 2032. And these were the parts that I wanted to discuss with you. So it says that resource adequacy risks increase over the next decade. After 2025, each subregion shows an increase in demand at risk indicator due to retirements throughout the decade. And then in addition, the planning reserve margin indicator continues to increase. And this is the key part here. This is primarily due to increasing variability from the addition of large amounts of variable energy resources, weather dependent renewables, and increasing demand variability with record levels of peak demand. So can you explain that demand at risk indicator and the planning reserve margin indicator, why these matter? I mean, can you do that off the top of your head? Well, I, I they, they matter because basically you always need uh, a reserve. I mean, you can't, you know... If you in the old days when there were thermal generators and not very much variable, you know, wind dependent generators, you had a ten percent reserve. That is, you predicted how how high uh, the demand on the grid was likely to go, and you made sure you had ten percent more than that plants. I mean, it's a, it's sort of like uh, anything you would do. You you want to have a little uh, a little extra. I mean, you know. A friend of mine was telling me of the time that he uh, he wasn't paying attention and he, he ended up drifting downhill to the gas station to fill up. He was on fumes. And he said, oh, my gosh, I can't imagine that I did that. But that was me younger, of course. But for Pete's sake. Well, how many of us pull into the gas station on fumes? We don't. We we watch that little thing that says, you're almost out of gas, and we fill up because everybody wants a reserve margin. They, nobody assumes that they'll make it into the gas station when they're out of gas. And, and, and the problem is that people don't know this. And one of the things that I get particularly concerned with is uh, how the whole thing is usually reported on. And and it's not the reporter's fault. It's just sort of the zeitgeist, but I, I, that's the way to say it. The idea is that w people want to hear about the great new things that are happening, the could grid, the great new batteries, the great new this, the great new that. And so, you know, I remember um, I was on a, 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 pro, a TV program one time, and I was show. I, I pulled up ISO New England, and I and and I and and I pulled up the uh, where our power is coming from, and then the other one that shows where our renewables are coming from. And she said, "Oh, but but renewables are only less than ten percent." I said, "Well, yeah." And she's like, "I didn't know that." Well, of course you wouldn't know that if you read the paper, right? You wouldn't know that, you you know, it's all the grand new world's renewable. Then I showed her the renewables one. It was 50% um, uh, biomass and refuse. And she was like, why? why? That can't be right. I said, no, it's right. I mean, the thing is that people don't know what's really happened. They don't know about the grid we have. The only thing they know about is the grid that supposedly we could have if we were just willing to invest all this money in it. And um, and is that well? Let me I, I follow up on that because uh, look, I'm 62. I've been in journalism trade for oh more than 30 years now, and I read some of the coverage, and I've been reading it, you know, particularly in the New Yorker lately. Um, oh please. <laughs> Also in the New York Times and the uh, bias. Well, I'll ask it this way. Do you see bias in media coverage of the grid and what is happening in the grid? And if so, what is it like? Well, the bias is that um, they don't talk about how choices we are making are hurting the grid and how it's becoming less reliable. Every time it becomes less reliable, that's a very big, exciting news event that they can report on. And uh, and, and then they get into, a, if you pardon me saying, so he said, she said, well, he said that we need more of the reliable power plants, but she said that what we need is to build more renewables. And then uh, another she said is that we actually need more, uh, more uh, uh, microgrids and homes that will 
will take care of themselves and 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 we don't even need these big old companies in their transmission lines and since so, so then someone else says well he, he, you know <laughs> and what i'm trying to say is it's not trying to find out the reality it's kind of responding to the 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 crisis and then having a lot of commentators on the crisis and Inst- it, instead it, of honestly, instead of the kind of analysis that would be, would cut through the crap Right, the, yes. the the kind of knowledge base that would come from, as in the case, in your case, forty years or so of knowing what this is about. That instead, it's a reporter that doesn't really know the what the grid is or how it functions, and so oh well, they're biased toward, frankly, biased toward renewables because well, they're renewable, therefore they must be good. But no understanding of is it fair to say that with very little understanding of what this means for the overall resilience, reliability, and affordability of the grid. Well, let's put it this way. It isn't reported as if there's no if there's an understanding of it. But I don't know whether the reporters themselves have no understanding. I think the reporters have more understanding, but they for some reason the the way that reporting goes nowadays a lot of the time is not a search for truth but a search for balance. If Joe says this, mm. then we have to get a uh, Jim who says that. And I, I, I just, I just, uh, I don't know if it's always been this way. I mean, in all honesty, when I was in the utilities, I was a corrosion chemist. I, I, I didn't really spend a lot of time with how the reporters were describing utilities. So I, I, you know, you'd have to talk to someone else about that. But my feeling is that there used to be uh, more. And, and our analysis shows, and now there's more, Joe says this and Jim says that. Right. Well, and I'm thinking of this report, uh, this article that was published in the New York Times by uh, this reporter, David Gellis, I think was his name. And it, it, the headline is, the U.S. will need thousands of wind farms. Will small towns go along? And at one county scheduled 19 nights of meetings to debate one wind farm. And I thought, I mean, the article is written like, oh, the, the, well, this is new. The, you know, these small towns are you know, opposing wind and solar projects. Well, no, I mean, this is not a new story. This is story has been going on for years, but it, this is kind of like, you know, oh, well, I just happened to find out, well, there's a resistance in rural America. And it was a lot of, he said, she said, and it was, oh, well, this guy said, you know, in the end, the article, as I remember, ends saying one minister, one policymaker in the county was saying, well, no matter what I do, we're going to have, some people are going to be mad at me, you know, or both sides are going to be mad at me or something to this effect. Without any kind of longer term understanding of what the what the overall impact of these things are, but again, that's not popular because of uh, this uh, image that renewable energy has. And that's a question I want to put to you. There is still, I think, that dominates a lot of this media reporting on that. That, that if it's renewable, it's inherently good. Do what? Do what? Is that right? And to what do you attribute that? Oh, there's a lot of different things. Some of it, some of it is uh, a lack of uh, carbon, but on the other hand, a carbon dioxide emissions. But when you get right down to it, if you're talking about um, refuse and biomass, there are carbon dioxide emissions. So I think that it is uh, renewable tends to be a a marketing term. You know, uh, for uh-huh. example, uh, uh, Vermont considers. Um, considers Hydro-Quebec to be renewable, but other states don't consider Hydro-Quebec to be renewable. I mean, it, it's just kind of weird. I mean, you know, there's a dam. Uh, the water falls upstream of the dam. Uh, it will continue to fall upstream of the dam by the natural forces of the of the of our globe, uh, and. Uh, but people will say, well, it's not renewable. Uh, and uh, it, it's an idea of being somehow in, in harmony with nature. And, and, mm. and uh, I, I, I really, I really uh, don't know about it. I, I do know that I, I am aware of some of the, the good things about renewables. And, and, and that is that, for example, um, with the geothermal or wind or whatever, you don't have any uh, big trains uh, carrying fuel around the country. I mean, it, it all the whole power cycle is right there. Wherever it is, it's there. And right. and I mean, 
that, that there is something very nice about that, something that I think is is excellent. But the problem is that the people uh, see this excellence and they say, well, that's all we need. But no, it isn't. We also need reliability. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but we need reliability. And if people say, well, we don't need reliability, as you said, if we don't have it, people will get it one way or another. They'll buy a generator. Right. So let's back up here then for a minute, because I'm, you know, I'm in Texas and ERCOT did okay during this recent cold snap. Um, but I've, I've been thinking about new nuclear and where new nuclear would fit into the grid in the U S and I'll ask the question this way. Can, can these new nuclear plants, can SMRs, can they compete in these RTO markets? Is it, can they even make it and make it economically uh, viable to build these plants if they would, of course, they get approved by the NRC and, you know, they find enough fuel and capital and the rest of it. Can, can new nuclear work in the way in these RTO systems, the way they are now? No, I don't think they can. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think any plant with a high capital cost can work in an RTO system. That's basically it. I mean, now, somebody can argue with me and say, well, you just don't understand how the markets work or something. I've been studying these markets forever. And all I can say is that they don't they don't allow for uh, high capital cost investments. So basically, uh, I don't think that new I think new nuclear will be built in um in in areas that aren't in RTOs. Now if I rarely uh, name uh, actual people, but one of the people, person, I, 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 I don't like to, uh, the former, uh, he just stepped down, uh, Chairman Glick of FERC. He was very, very pushing for uh, every part of the United States to be in an RTO. And he, one of the things he said is that in, in the non-RTO states, the uh, renewables aren't adopted as quickly. Now, you know, he used to work as a, a lobbyist for the big wind company in Redola. That's where he he came from. So, I mean, he's definitely pro-renewables. And, and so he's pushing for everybody to be an RTO because the RTO system uh, really is set up for renewables and natural gas. They're the ones that do great. And that's what we've got. That's what we've got. And, but is that why I mean, we've discussed this before, but is that is the lack of the, the, the southeastern U.S. is notable because there aren't many RTOs there and the renewable penetration in the southeastern U.S. is low. Is that yes. because of their the wind, the wind speeds are not as good in the southeastern U.S. or is it because the utilities there don't want to they don't see the value of renewables? Well, let's. I don't know. I'm not an expert on the wind speeds. The wind speeds are undoubtedly less there than they are, for example, in Nebraska. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's no question about that. But uh, I think that the other thing is that in those areas, the uh, Public Utilities Commission are still very aware that high priced or intermittent power will hurt the South's uh, attempt to get itself away from being the poor area of the United States, the poverty stricken area of the United right, States. Right. And and so they have been they have been pushing for uh uh for uh, factories uh, to to move south forever. I mean, you know, in New England we used to have this big uh uh textile industry. It all moved south. Because it was cheaper there, and uh, and 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 the people in the South were like, "Hey, come!" And we've got we've got a lot of workers, and we've got cheap electricity. You're going to love it here. And uh, and and and, and if, if right now there are, um, uh, if you're following what what's going on in in uh, Germany, there are big companies that are saying we had to close down because our in Germany because the electricity was so expensive and so unre and somewhat unreliable and we had to close down we couldn't make a living and we're not going to reopen that plant we're going to build a new plant somewhere else right well a lot of people in america are thinking maybe here and that's true maybe here but i'm going to tell you it won't be in new england it's going to be in the south if they right. decide they're building a plant somewhere else they're going to build it in the south 
Right. Well, the, the, which goes to the that essentiality of, of affordable, reliable electricity. And and just to add on what you said about the reliability part of it, as a friend of mine who's a lobbyist here in Austin, longtime lobbyist at the Capitol, he said, if you don't, if your power isn't reliable, it's not affordable. So that rely the affordability and the reliability go hand in hand, right? Yes. But if you don't have right. if you don't have the reliability, the affordability goes out the window. And that's one of the things that I've seen, you know, and it make my iron law of electricity, right? People do whatever they have to do to get the electricity they need. And that includes buying that standby generator to make sure they have juice when the grid fails. So these the the issues around affordability and reliability are uh, uh, they should be paramount. So, well, let me ask you then, if I if I could dub you, if were I king, and I say, okay, Meredith, you are the czar or czaress of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, like the electric grid. I don't think I've ever asked you this before, but it, it, do we need a federal in, intervention here? Do we need someone at the federal level to step in and and take charge on these kinds of things? If I mean, it's a very complex system, as you and I both just, you know, know very well, 3000 different electricity providers, all these different public utility commissions, you know, that, that it's an incredibly complex system. Can it be fixed? I mean, how do we how do we solve this problem, which is goes to the heart of the most fundamental, important network in our society? How do we move forward to make policymakers understand the necessity of these issues we've been talking about? Well, I think that we could do it simply, fa fairly simply, if we had the will to do it. We could, for example, say uh, the 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 uh, uh, Congress could direct FERC to make sure that um, uh, when when areas had unreliable power, uh, any any uh, utility which had unreliable power due to uh, uh, due to resource adequacy problems. Uh, it was going to be fined by the federal government if their PUC didn't bother. That they would that, that there was a law that said if you haven't built enough for resource adequacy, you're getting fined. All of a sudden, there would be a lot of interest in 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 building. Uh, similarly, the the federal government has made all kinds of. Uh, uh, subsidies and, and special uh, formats for uh, payments and, and for tax write-offs and stuff for the renewable industry. It could do that for the uh, nuclear industry. It could, it could uh, do a whole lot of different things that wouldn't be like we have to have a czar. It would just be like we're expecting the um, RTOs and the PUCs to have some pretty heavy fines for lack of reliability, because it can kill people. So as the U.S. government, we don't want our, our people getting killed. So that's what's happening. Get so used you're, to so it. you're saying we need we need the 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 solution may be I'm, I'm using that word may be for the for the federal government to provide carrots and sticks here to say yes. that to, to make afford a, to make reliability a more uh, a bigger imperative for all of the utilities across the country. Yeah, we don't have to, you say, well, there are 3,000 utilities. We don't have to force all those utilities to be nationalized. We don't have to force them all to be public power providers. We don't have to do, uh, we don't have to dissolve the PUCs. We don't have to dissolve the RTOs, so though I'd like to. But basically, um, <laughs> all you have to do is make there a real incentive for reliability. Well, you said dissolve the RTOs. That, that's interesting. So if, and I think we talked about this the other day, uh, just offline, that uh, Australia dissolved its market mechanism or its its auction system. So you're saying we'll go follow it, up on it that. Put it, it back. It put it back up. It only right. dissolved it for a while. It, right. it just it just said this is not working. We're taking a time out. Everybody just provide power. <laughs> so if you dissolve the RTOs, then does that necessarily mean we go back to monopoly type of 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 of, uh, of the market structures then? It probably would, but it would also be an accountable type of structure. Somebody uh, right. got really annoyed at me the other day and said, the trouble with you, Meredith, is you just want to go back to monopolies. That's what you grew up with, and that's what you like. And I said, no, 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 no. All I want to go back to is accountability. That's all I want. 
you know, it reminds me, and maybe I used this example before, but when I was writing my book on Enron now 20, well, 21 years ago, and I interviewed a, a, a former a Houston natural gas executive, his name was Jim Walzell, and he, he left Enron, uh, I guess, when Ken Lay came on board, he kind of saw the writing on the wall. He told me this a long time ago, when, in fact, before I published uh, 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 Pipe Dreams, he said, Bryce, I don't think that this deregulation of electricity is going to be good for the consumer. And that he, you know, he wasn't necessarily advocating for monopoly, but he just, I think he was seeing this pretty well about what was going to be this lack of accountability. And that's what I see in the ERCOT market. Now the legislature is coming back into session here in Austin in a few days. And, you know, there's a lot of talk at the public utility commission that we're going to do this fix and that fix. And I'm wondering whether the system has just become so complex with so many different carve outs and so many different interest groups that it's, it's so unwieldy. It's unlikely that they're, they're really going to be able to execute significant reform. Uh, am I right to be pessimistic? You should be pessimistic about it. It would only be form if 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 you can set up a carrot stick thing, an uh, incentive that says the utilities have to be reliable and they have to do whatever it takes to get reliable. Uh, and uh, But I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt, but is it the utilities or the generators themselves? Because this is one of the key things that's being discussed in ERCOT, that the, any of these new renewable uh, uh, providers that come on, and there's a ton of solar and wind coming onto the Texas grid, or right. the ERCOT grid, that they will have to be, that if they're going to bid in, that they have to have a reliability requirement, which isn't popular, of course, that these you know, these entities would rather, of course, free ride and not be forced to provide reliable power. But is that one possible solution? Well, yes, it is indeed. And 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 an intercot could 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 do that as an RTO. You know, you bid in. They, they they're always setting up some rules for how how you can bid in, and 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 you know they're always uh, watching carefully to make sure that you're not. Um, you're not uh, uh, exercising too much market power and you're not doing this and you're not doing that. And uh, with all this watching, it seems like the prices continue to go up, but um, they could require reliability. I mean, I think that's the simplest thing. If the problem is you don't have reliability, require reliability. And find them if they don't, if they don't. And do find so. them if they don't or promise them that uh, any capital expenditure that leads to reliability will be reimbursed over time. It'd be cheaper than what you're reimbursing for the early blackout. I mean, how many billions of dollars are in the queue to be paid back by ratepayers and taxpayers in Texas over the next 20 years because of one blackout? It's about it's about ten billion dollars is the is yeah, the number. You could that, do a lot of of upgrading for reliability for ten billion dollars. Well, and the ten billion only represents a part of the possible cost because you, we also have are facing in Texas this massive uh, batch of litigation, right, for personal injury right. losses um, that and the insurers, right, they're also suing the the generators. So. There, the, the, there's another shoe yet to drop here in terms of some of these costs and whether the courts will find that in, that uh, ERCOT has, uh, has, uh, 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 has immunity, right? That they, they sovereign immunity, but there's already been a court ruling here in Texas that says that ERCOT does not have sovereign immunity. So there, is a, there are a lot of costs that have yet to be worked out, worked out yet that I think are still very worrisome when it comes to ERCOT. So oh, yeah. Absolutely. I just want to say one thing about about uh, New England, and that is that ISO New England recently um, asked for an extra $10 million, no, $20 million next year, but they're going to save $10 million some other way for redesigning their markets. I don't know what they're going to do with that. But what I'm trying to say is people say a market, it's a market, but you could be spending millions and millions on designing the rules for these markets. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, just my feeling is instead of all this fussing around about we'll do it this way, we'll do it that way, require reliability and let the, let the people try and figure out how to uh, provide it. And yeah, I like that. It require reliability and let the generators figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's, it's a, it's a good way to, I think, and a short and easily understandable way to, to make that, uh, make that case. But I, I just want to come back to the nuclear part of it as well, because I've talked to a bunch of people here in Austin that I respect about 
the possibility of future nuclear in Texas. And you may recall X Energy has signed a deal with Dow to p potentially build an SMR at one of Dow's facilities on the Gulf Coast. Well, that could be an entry of nuclear into Texas, but it may be that that uh, power plant never p sells any electrons onto the grid, right? It may yes, just that they, that Dow would just use all that juice itself. Um, yes. Or, but so that's kind of a one-off, but it doesn't help in the overall decarbonization of the Texas grid and provide the kind of buffer that against higher uh, fluctuations in natural gas prices, which I think longer term is the, the key thing for Texas and for consumers is they need a hedge against this, uh, these, these rapid fluctuations in that gas prices because they're going to translate into higher power prices. Does that, does that ring true to you? That's true. And I'm, I'm just going to say that everywhere I look, People forget things that their mothers or fathers told them. Things like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. You know, everywhere I look, people are, are, are just forgetting that exists. And, and, and you know, we're going to electrify everything. And we're, we're going to run all that electricity on renewables and natural gas. No, that's a really bad idea. Well, it's let's, putting let's, too many eggs in those baskets. Yeah. Well, so we've been talking for a long time here, about an hour now, Meredith. So you know, I have the last two uh, two questions. What are you reading? What what the books on your bookshelf or other things that you're looking at? I know we we talked that you might be working on another book if you can uh, make that happen. Oh, yeah, I, I am I am uh, thinking about another book because you know I wrote I wrote uh, shorting the grid before Texas, right? And then of course a lot of people before the Texas blackout. And then a lot of people said, "Oh, Meredith, that's a great book. It showed me how the Texas blackout was happening. I didn't understand it at all, but your book helped." And I, and I, and I agree that it did. But I've been thinking that since then we've had the Texas blackout in, in Germany uh, with 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 uh, manufacturing leaving Germany. We've had all of this stuff happening, and and. And, you know, the book is not out of date. The book describes things, but I thought it, it's all evolved in ways that I'd like to talk about more. So yeah. I'm, 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 I'm doing that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then I've been reading uh, Vac Al Smell and so forth. You know, uh, I, I finished uh, um, um, The Way the World Really Works and uh, the... Um, the uh, uh, energy and civilization. That uh -huh. is a major thing. I feel like I want people all to know that I actually read every word of energy and civilization. <laughs> that's a, it's a, it's, he does not write, sh well, generally. Uh, that's a long book. Um, that and I is have, a long book. I, I have a bunch um, of his books. So, yeah, that, that's what I'm looking at. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm looking at all these things, like trying to find out the way other people aren't saying things like for example these near misses on the on the grid uh it wasn't that cold it wasn't 30 below it was it was zero you know i mean so it's electrification and 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 you know i'm, I'm looking at at things uh, uh like that more gotcha. and then um i also i will say i totally enjoyed reading um uh, uh, California Burning, a really interesting book on how uh, lack of um, lack of attention to um, maintenance can really mess a place up. And that's and, that's uh, Catherine Blunt, is that right? Yes, is, that's uh, right. Right. Yeah. So then, and, the last question, then, Meredith. Thank you. Yeah, one more. I'm going to oh, say yes. one more thing. Sure. I want to say thank you for starting a Substack. I'm reading that too, of course. Oh, well, good. Well, the Substack move, I was kind of forced off MailChimp. And uh, uh, I've found that the Substack has been, uh, I mean, just remarkable. I, I, you know, I have opportunities to write at Forbes and Real Clear, and I, and I plan to keep doing so. But I, I don't know. I just love this idea of having my own thing, my own platform, and having that. It's just been uh, refreshing and, and frankly, uh, uh, heartening and, and, uh, just a little bit of relief that I, oh, okay, well here, I can say whatever I want. I don't have to send it through an editor. I don't have to go through somebody else's, you know, system. I've got my, I can build my own brand and it, yeah. it feeds on what Oprah Winfrey said when uh, it was in an article about Tyler Perry some time ago, uh, she said, own yourself. She said, own yourself. It'll take you like whoosh. 
what I'm assuming she does with this. But I just thought it was a great idea, you know, and it's so that that this uh, thank you for that. So I'll, I'll stop with that. Last question. You know, this one, you've had it now four times before because you this is your fifth appearance. You've been through the black a blackout now. We've seen these other major events on the on the grid in the U.S. Um, what gives you hope? Well, what gives me hope is is uh, people who are really making changes in a positive direction, and and there's so many of them. Um, uh, there's of course there's there's you uh, and and there's but but I'm thinking about the people who are organizing groups. I'm thinking of Generation Atomic. I'm thinking of uh, uh, Chris Kiefer up in in in. Um, in uh, uh, Toronto. Toronto, I'm thinking of uh, Zion Lights in Europe. Uh, all of these people are 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 influenced. T. S. Beckers uh, in in Holland. All of these people are 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 definitely you know um, uh, making changes that are a pleasure to see. Just a pleasure to see. Yeah. I agree. I, the, there's a different, there's a different vibe, a different, different, uh, different sensibility and, and a new, this younger generation. And I can say that now that I'm an old guy, but it, it's, it's, it's gratifying and, and very hopeful. So, but that's yeah. a good place to stop. I think Meredith, um, unless you have something else you want to add, I think that. Oh uh, yes. Buy my book. I always add buy my oh, book. Oh, right. So I haven't even mentioned <laughs> I've, I've failed badly at that the station identification here. Uh, Meredith, you can find more about her uh, uh, at Meredith Angwin on Twitter. She has a webpage, MeredithAngwin.com. Buy her book, Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Own of Our Electric Grid. She self-published. It's a remarkable book that has uh, been uh, seen now far and wide. People in, in, in all across the around the world have been reading your book. And it's been uh, quite an amazing uh, journey to see you uh, succeed uh, in a whole new career um, in your <laughs> in uh, the the one of the the, the an older uh, an older period of your life i'll put it that yes, way how about yes, that yes. okay well good well we'll stop there meredith thanks a million for your coming back on the power hungry podcast for a record fifth time uh, always a pleasure to talk to you thank you it's a pleasure to talk to you and to all you out there in podcast land thanks for tuning into this episode of the power hungry podcast until next time see you 